Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ready to start our talk five minutes late, <laughs> but that's, that's what earned value means, right? Okay. <laughs> so, Caitlin Kenny is going to give us a talk on earned value management. And because of the lack of time, I'm not going to talk too much about her. She'll tell you a little bit about herself. So, thank you. Will do. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, like he said, my name is Caitlin Kenny, uh, and I'm a uh, industrial and systems engineer by degree. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Maryland program uh, in systems engineering. And uh, tonight I'm gonna talk to you about um, how we can use earned value management and agile software development projects. Um, I'm a licensed professional engineer in Maryland and Illinois, uh, and I'm currently working as a systems engineer for ISM Corp uh, down at the Washington Navy Yard supporting Aegis Combat Systems Development. So. Uh, have some experience applying this a little bit. So what exactly is earned value management and why is it important? Well, if you're not familiar, um, earned value management is used to measure how a project is meeting its costs and schedule plan. It also allows project managers to determine the risks associated with achieving that plan costs and schedule goals. And it provides a mechanism for estimating expected project completion and final cost. So prior to EVM, uh, managing complex projects with integrated cost schedule and performance dependencies presented many risks for project managers. They didn't have that baseline to measure against. So earned value management provides a way to identify costs and schedule drivers within your project. By identifying the variance between planned and actuals through a targeted work breakdown structure, areas of risk and root causes can be identified and addressed early in the project instead of at the end. So earned value management provides a means of conducting a targeted analysis by project element to identify what is causing an issue or likely to cause an issue in the future. So there's a common misconception uh, within the software development community that earned value management is too challenging or too costly to apply to software development projects. And the purpose of my work was to review the current industry applications of earned value management to agile software development. Uh, the goal was to identify practices that support the use of earned value management in agile software projects, as well as what those limitations are um, within those different types of projects. So traditional EVM assumes that projects have well-defined work packages and tasks with strict linear schedules. However, since the early 2000s, with the increase of software development projects, software development methodologies such as agile have become more common. Agile includes a set of methods that focus on individuals and interactions over processes and tools, uh, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiations, and uh, responding to change over following a plan. If that sounds familiar, it's because that's from the Agile Manifesto. But despite these seeming contradictions of values, the application of modified EVM techniques to Agile software development projects can achieve improved control and monitoring. So to understand how it can be applied to software projects, it's important to first understand how software is developed. So software development life cycles uh, models, or SDLCs, provide the framework for how software will be planned, managed, developed, and controlled. So SDLCs take a systems thinking approach to that software development. And some of those examples uh, include waterfall, V-shaped, or an iterative life cycle model. So what exactly are those? So this is a waterfall uh, lifecycle model. A waterfall approach for software development uses sequential project management steps to manage project activities. Most of the tasks are predefined with set durations and resources, allowing a detailed project schedule and budget to be developed. The phases of a waterfall approach uh, include requirements definition, design, coding, and unit test, and integration and system test, and operation and maintenance. So using a waterfall approach, the software requirements are analyzed and defined upfront through consultation with the system users and other stakeholders. The requirements are then allocated to the software design, requiring identification of the software internal and external interfaces, abstractions, and relationships. This can often become difficult because the requirements of our software design may grow as these relationships are reviewed and developed as we gain more information. So once the design phase is complete, the project moves into implementation or coding and unit test. The software is developed in a set of units and tested by unit specifications. And then the project moves to integration and system testing in which the software is tested as a complete solution to ensure that all requirements have been met and all defects have been resolved. 
Finally, once the software is complete, it moves into its operation mode, operation and maintenance, in which it's turned over to the user for practical use. Errors are corrected and updates are implemented throughout that maintenance period. However, you can probably see, just now stepping through that, that there's some issues with this. There's some limits. It limits the ability to change requirements and correct errors and issues. And this is because it requires that software requirements are well-defined up front. However, that's not the case often in software development projects. As stakeholders uh, can only define a needed capability or function, and that may evolve throughout the life of the project. So it's up to the software developers to determine the best way to design the code to meet those needs. And this can result in issues late in the development when the design does not work as expected or the stakeholder is unhappy with the end result. It can be costly and time consuming to wait until the end of a project to make large corrections or changes to software. So the second lifecycle model that we'll go through is V-shaped. Um, the V-shaped LCM in indicates that software development project phases at the high level, decision gates, which are, include things like technical reviews and key phase relationships. The V-shaped LCM model identifies the need for constant validation with stakeholders as requirements are defined and decomposed, including the development of the verification plans in tandem with requirements definition. Time and software maturity increase from left to right within the model, representing the evolving baseline based on the stakeholder requirements. So the V-shaped LCM in software development is often seen as rigid and somewhat inflexible, encouraging a linear view of software development. While it's an improvement over the waterfall lifecycle model with a focus on test planning, it still does not conduct testing until the design is near completion. And this leaves the project open to cost and schedule risk if issues or errors are found late in the process. So the last lifecycle model we'll go through is the iterative, iterative lifecycle model. There are many others, um, but for the purposes of tonight's discussion, I chose these three. So the iterative lifecycle model, also referred to as incremental and iterative development, allows projects to produce initial and successive capabilities through iterative development and incremental delivery. So generally, this model is used when the requirements are not clearly defined at the beginning of the project, the funding is constrained, and the ability to make changes or experiment late in the development process is desired, such as maybe prototyping a new technology. At each iteration, modifications to the software are made and new functional capabilities, or sometimes called features, are added and delivered throughout each increment. So the iterative lifecycle model allows feedback during iterations to be incorporated in a timely manner, not just during verification. It also allows for stakeholder participation throughout the process, not just during the beginning or at the very end of the development, it's throughout. Stakeholders provide feedback, again, throughout the development, further refining the requirements as the software is developed. And finally, the iterative lifecycle model reduces risk by identifying and fixing issues early, benefiting the cost in the schedule. So within the various SDLC models just discussed exists a common industry practice for developing software called Agile. Agile is often used within the iterative lifecycle model. It's not a process, um, but rather it's an umbrella term used to refer to several methodologies that emphasize the four Agile methods and 12 principles of the Agile manifesto. Um, it was developed in the early 2000s and it's been in, in place uh, ever since. So, as you can see up here, just to reiterate, the four methods um, that Agile focuses on are individuals and interactions, working software, customer collaboration, and responding to change. And given these methods, there's a common software development approach used within Agile called Scrum. So Scrum is not a methodology, but it's more of a framework. Um, it focuses on small cross-functional teams working in small cycles called sprints to deliver iterative incremental capability of a product. Sprints allow for learning, adapting, and evolving as the product matures and the project progresses. All remaining work that needs to be completed on the project, including the problems that need to be solved, not necessarily how to solve them, are contained in the backlog. The team identifies work from the backlog at the beginning of the sprint known as sprint planning. Sprints are usually about two weeks to maybe four weeks long uh, and include a planning phase to identify work from the backlog. Daily scrum meetings are used by the teams to share progress on that work uh, during sprint reviews and sprint retrospectives as well. So the daily scrum, the sprint review and retrospective provide opportunities for iteration and problem solving. In addition, the software coding 
In addition to software coding, each sprint involves testing and defect resolution, resulting in delivery of an incremental product capability. So any work that's not completed is moved to the next sprint or the backlog and reprioritized by the team. So this gives an example of the overall Scrum process. The product backlog fe feeds the sprint backlog. A sprint can be up to 30 days. And during that time, the design is tested. If errors are found, then the team tries to correct them as quickly as possible. In this example, it shows 24 hours. And finally, the result is a working increment of software, which ultimately can be part of an overall release. So Scrum does not produce a traditional task-focused work breakdown structure. Instead, most Scrum software development projects produce a release plan. Sometimes this is called something else, um, but for tonight, I'm gonna refer to it as a release plan. Release plans focus on the functionality delivered to a product as a result of a series of sprints. So there are multiple ways to create release plans, including a focus on features or dates, but generally it lays out which features will be implemented for each release of a product. The corresponding sprints, stories, and story points, i.e. the work that needs to be completed uh, to complete that feature, are then laid out to get an idea of how much effort is needed. The information from the release plan, plus the expected cost from the cost estimate, which I'll talk about next, can be used to create a pseudo Wibis, which is shown there on the left. So projects use a combination of top-down or bottom-up approaches to develop an estimate. From there, project managers can apply multiple cost estimating techniques, including analogy, parametric buildup, and extrapolation from actuals. A top-down approach is generally based on historical data, which provides a quick but less accurate estimate. Using information available creates a gross-level estimate instead of a detailed estimate. In contrast, a bottoms-up approach is generally based on very detailed requirements and plans, providing an increased level of detail within the estimate. It provides project managers a lower level of detail and an improved understanding of costs and schedule drivers. However, it requires more planning and detailed analysis up front. So there are many types of cost estimating techniques um, that I previously mentioned, but they also include an uh, analogy, parametric, buildup, or extrapolation from actuals. And projects can use a combination of these methods depending on the type of work being completed and the information available or known about the work. So since detail level planning for agile projects projects is done by releases and sprints, they generally use a top-down approach to develop their cost estimates. A top-down approach in a, in a software development project requires iterative cost estimation, meaning the estimate is done progressively over time and refined through rolling wave planning. Methods that deliver cost estimates at the task level or just in time. So as more information becomes available and plans become more detailed, the estimate is updated and refined. Once you get more information, you can improve your estimate. The techniques used to develop a software cost estimate are similar to traditional cost estimation techniques and include, again, analogy, parametric, and buildup. The factors that influence the cost uh, include size, the complexity, referring to things like the integration, the programming language that you're using, the percent of new or reused code, uh, as well as the development capability, uh, <coughs> meaning that do you have the right personnel, do you have the facilities, and do you have the tools available to complete the delivery? Size is the major cost driver for software development projects. So often the major challenge with software development cost estimation is the lack of historical data available, making the entire estimating process less statistically based. There are multiple methods for estimating software development project size, including measuring source lines of code or equivalent source lines of code, often referred to as SLOC or ESLOC, uh, performing function point analysis or story point analysis. And for this discussion tonight, we're gonna to focus on story point analysis. So what exactly is that? So story point analysis involves assigning story points, a unit of measure for expressing a software development effort, a point value for the effort to complete the item. The individual values are not really that important. Um, however, the relative value that the software development team assigns to those story points reflects the effort of the tasks involved. So something that's assigned to two should roughly be twice as much as something that's assigned to one. There are multiple methods for assigning these values, but the most common method that's used within industry is the Fibonacci sequence, which assigns values of one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 20, 40, and 41. Um, it's easier for developers to distinguish the amount of effort between a one and a five versus maybe a four and a five. 
Using that sequence uh, addresses the inherent uncertainty with estimating large tasks and identifying a base story uh, for the team to use as a reference for the definition of done and the lowest level of complexity can be a useful way to set parameters within the team. So the numbers represent relative size of the effort, not necessarily time. Planning poker um, uses the Fibonacci sequence and assigns each value to a set of cards. Each team member is then provided their own set of cards with all the values. The item is presented to the group and discussed, and then each team member picks a value to assign to that effort. If everyone selects the same value, then that becomes a story point value for that item. However, if there's disagreement, the team members who uh, selected the highest and lowest present their arguments for their selection. So the team then selects values again after that discussion until they can reach a consensus. The reason this is important is because if I select something very low and you select something very high, you may have additional information about that task that I'm unfamiliar with. And so for, in order for us to get that accuracy in our estimate, we have to collaborate and we have to share that information with each other. So it's important to understand that multiple teams will use the method for the same project, but each team may have different definitions for the same number of story points. So my two may be different than another team's two, um, and that's okay, but we just need to keep that in mind. Story point estimates become more accurate over time as more information becomes available and the team has more historical information. Developers can establish an estimated number of hours per story point and multiply it by the labor rate to get an expected cost. However, story points uh, can be converted to more detailed man hour estimates once the velocity, is, velocity has been established after the first sprint. So once the first sprint is complete, the number of story points per sprint is established, that's your velocity, and can be used to forecast future sprint performance. The total number of man hours per sprint can be reevaluated for the overall sprint and then for each story point. So it must be noted that, again, having multiple labor rates for any of the estimation techniques requires that the man hours are broken out by labor type and multiplied by the specified labor rate. This will provide a higher fidelity estimate. For this example, a senior developer may take less hours to complete a task, but it will cost more than a junior developer. So that also adds some variance into our story point analysis. So, before we dig into how EVM can be specifically applied to agile development projects, we need to review some EVM terminology um, for any folks that aren't familiar. So if you are familiar, this should all look familiar. Uh, look, uh, you, you've all seen this before, so it looks, should look familiar. But the project parameters are used to assess the project performance for earned value management. So um, at the top, you have plan value, or otherwise known as PV, which is the authorized budget assigned to the scheduled work. It's also referred to as the budgeted cost of work schedule, the BCWS. Uh, and it sets the cost baseline for the project. Then you have the uh, budget at completion, the BAC, which is the sum of all budgets established for the work to be performed. You have the actual cost or the AC, which is the realized cost incurred for the work performed on an activity during a specific time period. It's also referred to as ACWP. Uh, and then you have the earn value or the EV, which is a measure of work performed expressed in terms of budget authorized for that work. It's also referred to as the budgeted cost of work performance or BCWP. There are four defined project performance measures for EVM. These performance indicators show if the project is behind on or ahead of schedule and or budget. So if the cost and schedule variance are greater than zero, then it's considered favorable. The closer to zero, the closer the project is to being on time and or budget. If the cost and schedule performance index, the CPI or SPI, are greater than one, then it's considered favorable. The closer to one, the closer the project is to being on time and or budget. So cost variance is the amount of the budget deficit uh, or surplus at a given point in time, expresses the difference between the earned value and the actual cost. Schedule variance, or SV, is a measure of the schedule performance expressed as the difference between the earned value and the planned value. The cost performance index, CPI, is a measure of the cost efficiency of budgeted resources expressed as a ratio of earned value to the actual cost. Schedule performance index, SPI, is a measure of schedule efficiency expressed as the ratio of earned value to planned value. I have those equations up there for you. 
So EBM provides a way for project managers to review project performance and trends and conduct cost forecasting to determine if a project will complete behind, on, or ahead of schedule and or budget. The following provide forecasted project cost. Estimate to completion ETC is the expected cost to finish all the remaining project work. Estimate at complete or EAC is the expected total cost of completing all the work, expresses the sum of the actual cost to date and the estimate to complete. Variance at completion or VAC is a projection of the amount of budget deficit or surplus, expresses the difference between the budget at completion and the estimate at completion. And again, those are expressed as the formulas on the slide. So given all that EV terminology, the other piece that we're missing or that we've kind of alluded to is the work breakdown structure. So the work breakdown structure decomposes the total scope of the project into the lowest level work package for which cost and duration are assigned. Project scope is broken down into smaller discrete tasks with finite start and end dates, estimated durations, man hours, and labor costs. And the information is used to develop a fully loaded and resourced integrated master schedule with all task dependencies shown and the project critical path identified. This becomes a basis for the project EVM metrics and is used to track the actuals versus the estimates for cost and schedule. So in order for EVM to provide value to the project manager on the status of their project, the method to determine work package progress also needs to be determined during project planning with clear parameters and requirements for declaring progress or credit. When are we done, quote unquote. There are many methods, including assessing the number of units completed, setting incremental milestones, start to finish, which is either, I'm either 0% or 100%, there's no partial credit, uh, level of effort tasks or individual uh, or subject matter judgment. So project managers should carefully assign a method for each work package to ensure that the reported EVM metrics are an accurate reflection of the project progress. So you'll notice <laughs> this work breakdown structure is for traditional hardware, right? It's for an aircraft system, but we don't necessarily have that in software development, uh, which is where that pseudo Wibis or release management plan comes into play. So using an agile scrum approach for software development, project managers can implement EVM to track project costs and schedule and performance. And since Scrum involves planning work into sprints and the overall project planning process is different than waterfall. Scrum projects have initial plans and tasks to accomplish an end goal. However, the details related to the number of steps to accomplish a task may fluctuate as more information becomes available. Software is developed, tested, and implemented iteratively. Initial estimates are then adjusted to reflect what has been learned as the project progresses. So as I mentioned previously, Scrum does not produce that traditional task force work breakdown structure. Instead, most Scrum software development projects will produce a release plan, which acts as that pseudo WIBIS. So the release plan has a collection of sprints and story points targeted to deliver certain features by that release of that product. Scrum software development projects uh, use estimating techniques like SLOC and ESLOC function point or story point analysis to establish a cost baseline. And regardless of the estimation method used, the end result is an estimate of effort, person months, or man hours to complete a project which can be multiplied by the hourly rate to estimate the cost and establish the plan, uh, plan value or the BCWS. So now that we've gone through all of those equations for EVM, how do they apply to Agile or how do they apply to Scrum in this example? The method that I'll discuss here is not true EV, um, but it's kind of EV light. Uh, the method looks at the expected and actual percent complete for the story points within each sprint. However, in order to apply this method, you have to assume that all story points are weighted the same, meaning that one story point is equivalent to another in terms of cost and effort. This, however, may not be the case, as we mentioned previously. Variation across the planning poker teams and the application of story points may increase the variation in the calculations. So in order to apply EVM to Scrum, the following EV terms need to be clearly defined and understood in terms of Scrum. So we have the expected percent complete, which is the number of estimated story points per scheduled increment divided by the total story points. We have the actual percent complete, which is the total story points completed divided by the total estimated story points. We have plan value or PV, which is the sum of the estimated feature sizes for all the features up until the plan date. It's also again referred to as the BCWS or the budgeted cost of work scheduled. 
uh, we have the actual cost, which is the realized cost incurred for the work performed on an activity during a specific time period. It's also referred to as the ACWP or the actual cost of work performed. And we have earned value, which is the value of work completed at the same dates as used for PV. It's not actual cost or business value, it's the work earned against the work planned. So we also have the cost performance index. It can be estimated as the user story points completed divided by the equivalent point, uh, points per hour. Scheduled performance index, which is estimated as the user story points completed divided by the user story points scheduled. Estimate at complete or EAC can be estimated by dividing the total budget by the cost uh, performance index or the CPI. And the estimate to complete, the ETC, can be estimated by dividing the SPI into the total estimated number of story points. So what does it look like? <laughs> EVM for Agile uses things like uh, burn up charts, burn down, and velocity charts, which are traditional to Agile, but we're just applying them from an EV perspective to show our project progress. So a burn up chart shows the work completed versus time, similar to EVM, PV, or EV, that plan value or earn value. And this is a sample release burn up chart. The Y axis shows the number of story points planned for the release, while the X axis shows the iteration. The green line represents the story points completed, while the red, blue, and purple represent the high, average, and low forecast for that completion. A burn down chart shows the remaining effort known as the backlog versus the time remaining on the project. So effort can be measured in hours, days, or story points. Schedule variance can be converted to monetary units by multiplying uh, SV as a percentage of the total features or story points by the project's BAC. Additionally, taking the converted SV with the project's resources and burn rate can provide the latest revised estimate of the project EAC. Using a burn down chart, such as the one shown on the slide, the cumulative SV can be tracked, showing the overall impacts to the project. So the sample burn down chart estimates remaining hours on the Y axis, the number of days within the project on the X axis, and the remaining and completed tasks with respect to estimated hours on the far right side. So the green line represents the ideal burn down rate, while the blue represents the remaining effort per task, and the yellow bar represents the completed tasks. As I previously mentioned, effort can be measured in hours, days, or story points. So each story point will take a certain amount of hours to complete and could be converted to or from hours and story points as needed, depending on what you're looking for. So this is a velocity assessment chart. Uh, velocity assessments show the number of story points completed during a sprint and help project managers determine overall progress. Velocity can be thought of as the rate at which the team is delivering value to the end product. So this is an example of an, a velocity assessment chart. It shows the total number of tasks planned and completed for each sprint. And this type of chart can be used to revise the forecasted delivery for the project. It can also be used by the scrum team to understand their sprint planning, team strengths and weaknesses to improve future sprint deliveries. If you've assigned a cost to a story point, this chart can then be used to show the expected and actual cost per story point per sprint by doing a simple conversion. This could then be used to adjust the cost estimates, including labor hours or remaining work. So no matter how progress is reported, it's measured the same in all Agile and Scrum projects. Using start to finish, which is either zero or 100% complete, there's no partial credit taken for in progress or incomplete work. So I just showed you a lot of equations. Let's walk through an example. So sprints in an Agile Scum software development project are similar to work packages in a waterfall project, uh, meaning that they break down the larger scope of a project into those defined increments. Use of epics, sprints, story points are all ways to further break down the project scope into smaller discrete tasks. This example is based on Suleiman Barton and Blackburn adaptation of EVM to Agile, but it's been modified and it uses story point analysis to establish a project baseline. The example covers a Scrum software development project for a new online retail website, and the story points are used to calculate project schedule and cost performance indicators. This allows forecasting not only for the sprints, but the overall project and can be used in addition to the Agile burn charts and velocity assessment for EVM. So there are 13 features. They're split amongst four increments, 
of 30 days each with 253 estimated story points. Progress is measured using the start to finish, again, zero or 100%, no partial complete method. And credit is not taken for the story points that are still in progress until they're complete. So in this example, the first increment is complete. To establish the cost baseline, the expected cost was calculated using story point analysis. The labor types were assumed to be the same for this example. All developers are the same category of labor type and therefore have the same labor rate of $150 per hour. So one story point in this example is equal to eight man hours of work. A Fibonacci scale was used to assign the expected story point values and establish the schedule baseline. The total project budget is $303,600. So using the EVM formulas for Scrum that we just went through, we calculate the following values. So the expected percent complete is the number of estimated story points per increment divided by the total story points. This can be used to calculate the plan value, the actual percent complete, and the earned value. And the project is currently under budget. The earned value is less than plan value. Uh, but it's also behind schedule. So the actual percent complete versus the expected percent complete. Plan value and earn value can be used to calculate the CPI and the SPI to determine if the project is on, under, or over budget, and on, ahead, or behind schedule. So values greater than one mean that the project are under budget or ahead of schedule. Uh, values equal to one mean that the project is on budget or on schedule. And finally, values less than one mean that the project is over budget or behind schedule. So here we have a negative cost and schedule variance, indicating that the project is over its planned budget and behind planned schedule. So CPI is less than one and the project is over budget. SPI is less than one and the project is behind schedule. So using the CPI and the EAC, the EAC can be estimated by dividing the total budget by the CPI. This isn't necessarily the most accurate way for us to calculate EAC. However, it's sufficient for identifying trends and taking corrective action. Further, using the SPI and ETC can be estimated by dividing the estimated story points uh, total by the SPI. So for this example, the project is currently predicted to be about $131,000 over budget at this time, that EAC equation, and it's expected to need about 24 additional story points to complete that ETC equation. So using all the information that we calculated, we can then uh, create the project burn up, burn down, and velocity charts. So here's our burn up chart. The burn up chart shows that the first increment has been completed, not meeting the planned number of story points. Considering that only one increment has been completed, there is not enough information to generate that high, low forecast for this chart yet. It's only the first increment, <laughs> um, which would require three previously completed increments and a standard deviation. Therefore, the estimated to complete or the ETC will provide a better indication of how we're doing with our project schedule. So here's our burn down chart. Our burn down chart shows that the first increment story points were not completed as planned. As additional increments are completed, the chart will begin to show trends regarding project schedule and completion. Um, it's important to remember that the total number of story points in each increment may change as the backlog is planned and work is further defined. The burn down chart will show project completion progress as more information is collected and becomes available. Finally, since only one increment has been completed, a velocity chart which normally looks at the number of estimated story points versus the completed story points by sprint um, does, not create, uh, does not provide much value at this point in time from a release planning perspective yet. However, it could be modified and used to look at the number of story points per feature to see how well the project planning is aligning with the actual performance. Since Scrum encourages updating the backlog after each increment, resulting in an update to the number of estimated story points for each feature, it's necessary to re-baseline after each increment. This results in recalculating the EVM values based on the updated estimates and actual data, validating the modified backlog against the release plan. Therefore, changes that affect cost and schedule for release completion can be evaluated early and often. So the use of earned value management within industry for Scrum and agile software development projects continues to increase. Uh, the application of EV Lite uh, to those story points provides a way for us to combine traditional project management techniques and Agile. 
And while it's certainly not perfect um, and has room for improvement, it demonstrates that the application of EVM for agile software development projects is indeed possible and provides managers with a means to identify costs and schedule risks and issues within their projects. It provides a means of conducting a targeted analysis by project element to identify what is causing an issue or likely to cause an issue in the future, allowing project managers to adjust. EVM for Agile can help managers identify problem areas and provide updated costs and schedule estimates throughout that project. One possible improvement is to apply traditional EVM equations at the sprint level instead of the story point level, creating a quote pseudo Wibis um, that lists out each sprint with an estimated cost to create the overall cost estimate of the product would allow the project manager to apply traditional EVM equations instead of EV Lite, which is what we reviewed tonight. So as more traditional waterfall organizations adopt Agile and Scrum approaches, there will be continued room for improvement and refinement of how EVM is applied. With that, thank you all very much. Are there questions? <laughs> Thank you. The theory sounds great. I'm wondering if you have applied this on any projects I and have. how it went. I have. So um, I've actually have the pleasure of I've been now part of two DOD pilot uh, programs, agile pilot programs. I'm currently working one for the Navy um, and we do use EVM as part of our contract as part of our agile development. Um, we apply it a little bit differently than this. We don't go down to the story point level because we're not using story points, um, but we do apply it at the feature level. Uh, so we have a capability-based WIBIS um, that we use uh, and then apply EV techniques based on that. So it is in use. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, for your example that you provided, yes. is a, the, at the work package level, is a sprint an increment? It can be, it depends on the project. In this particular example, um, these are listed out as features, and then we have story points associated with each. Okay, so the features is at the release level? The features are at the sprint level. I think that was your question. Right? Well, I was wondering, um, for the work packages, because in EVM you have work packages and planning packages. Yeah. And so your work packages are your sprint, because I was just trying to figure out um, where the durations came in and aligning it with the schedule and cost. Where the durations came in. So durations come in at the sprint or the product, hang on, let me go back, or the product increment. Sprint is a product increment. So each sprint would be two weeks. Two weeks, okay, yeah. so that's your work package level. Yes. Okay, and then, so like um, quantifiable backup data, I guess would be the, the different story points that roll up to your, yes. your work package level? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, it, when we tried to attempt this for, for the, using it at the story point level, mm -hmm it got very cumbersome because so many things bounced in and outside of the product backlog. And so I was wondering if you could just ad address that because um, maybe I'm, I'm missing, missing the logistics of it because when we um, implemented Agile, we did it at the release level mm -hmm. uh, and tracked the dollars that way. Yeah. Because we were more clear on what the endpoint was going to be. Yeah. So it... I'm not saying that this applies to all projects or all programs, and certainly applying it at the release level is different than applying it at the increment. Um, in this particular example, this is a pretty small example, right? There's only a 13 different features here. I'm assuming in your program that you had more? Yes. Yeah, so, so it might be a larger scope. So in that standpoint, it might make more sense to apply it at the release level versus the increment level, exactly to your point, because managing those stories points back and forth, moving things back and forth in your backlog and constantly grooming can be limited by the tools and resources that you have available. So um, this isn't a, a catch-all for all programs, uh, but this is just one way of doing it. Understood, thank yeah. you. Yep. So I Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. 
<laughs> for the developers um, in their skill levels mm -hmm. and using the Fibonacci method, yep. accounting for variances there with so, the earned value. How did you, did you do that? No, and, so, and I think I stated that in the talk and I apologize if it wasn't clear. So in this particular example, we assume that it is all the same, a right. story point is equivalent, right? right. And that it, we're using it across the standpoint. So one of the, one of the ways that we can improve this is by looking at those individual labor categories and making sure that we understand what those story points mean because from team to team, they may be different but as right. well. But yep. you don't have any concrete, like you haven't implemented that in your projects, your live projects or? So in my current project, we're doing that. In this particular example, it's How, not covered. Are you, are you finding it challenging? Are you having success? Because um, I think that that's a key, a very key factor. And sure. I've found in my travels that uh, the level of effort mm -hmm. of how long it's going to take a developer to develop something is not a true value. Whether they have 20 years experience or five years experience, I right. find that they can, they tend to es underestimate. Um, for a senior <laughs> developer, they underestimate the assistance that they're going to, the, they spend less time Work, they have less time during the release to work on an item that they have taken upon because they're championing junior developers. Right. They underestimate that a lot. Right. Um, I'm, not un, I'm not suggesting that they're under, and underestimating their skill, just how often they're pulled away right. from it. And then the junior developers do underestimate their skill level a little bit their or their understanding well. right. of, of the problem. Right. So I was just wondering if you had a real world example and if you sure. were having success and how did you handle those challenges? Yeah, so I will just share, uh, I can't tell you too much about the project that I'm working on, but I will just share kind of a general example. Um, we as humans are very optimistic right? We tend to, we tend to exactly what you said, underestimate our abilities. Um, so generally the trend that we've seen is that early on, we'll see a lot, that increase in variance will be way behind or way ahead, right? Because we didn't estimate very well, but because this requires rolling wave planning and we're constantly doing that backlog grooming, those estimates tend to get better over time and that variance tends to shrink is the trend that we're seeing. Um, course, it depends on multiple factors, people, resources, tools, etc. cetera. Um, but that has been the, the trend in the project that I'm on now. Yep. You mentioned rebasing at the end of each increment. Could you yes. explain what do you mean by that? Yeah, rebasing? so essentially uh, I've run through an increment. I finished, right? And I came out and I realized that my, exactly what you mentioned before, my story points are a little bit off. Why are they off? Well, now I can go investigate and look and see, you know what, this actually takes a little bit more time. And so when I start my planning for my next increment or for my next sprint, I can essentially take those lessons learned from the previous sprint and apply them and maybe adjust my estimates based on that. Um, so the trend is though, in a traditional waterfall project, we have a cost baseline, right? Or cost estimate that we start our project with and we measure everything directly back to that. But the reality is that if you're using things like story points or e -slog, those numbers will go up and down consistently and they should, right? Because we have more information, more data as the project progresses. But understanding what those changes are and documenting that and understanding why is really important that we communicate that both through our teams and with leadership. So that's why we re-baseline. Um, just some uh, thoughts based on my own experience in multiple projects and even in my personal life that uh, Things never go as planned, and that's kind of partly due to there being lots of mishaps. You drive to Costco, and the lines are out the door, so your planned hour trip turns into two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering 
is the Scrum approach using earned value versus more traditional V or whatever else you pick. Has anyone really done any studies to find out whether these are more effective or robust in the presence of mishaps? If earned value is more effective or if agile no, is more effective? No, the, the, the agile using earned value versus using earned value under uh, 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 other type, like a, um, like a, a waterfall hard, or yeah. any thing. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't yeah. know. And the reason I don't know is because I'm not sure how you would compare them. They're kind of apples to oranges. Okay. So, and the other comment is that yeah. Uh, one of the big concerns of the, the uh, currently in the software engineering field is that of the idea of craftsmanship. And there's some concerns by some of the people who actually founded Ad, Agile, who came up with the, uh, I guess it the was manifesto. the manifesto. Manifesto. <laughs> yeah. That this has gotten in the hands of management types, the suits, mm -hmm. and as a result, it's undermined the quality of uh, software development. Sure. Because software development is kind of a quirky thing. You have different people of different skill levels and people who persist, you know, into long hours at the night to ensure some, something they un uncovered that was unanticipated or was a flaw gets fixed versus people who are, you know, hey, it's five o'clock, I'm out of here. And so um, I, I, re I just wanna bring to everyone's attention that there's some interesting discussions on YouTube by this guy, Bob Martin, who I believe was one of the founders. Mm -hmm. And he's, I guess he goes by Uncle Bob, but he's, he's raising the issue that these types of management techniques and other things, one has to be careful that you're not undermining the ultimate quality of the product. And he's right. putting forth the argument that this is a safety issue that has tremendous consequences. And he's claiming that someday, eventually, 10, 10 million people are gonna get killed and it'll be traced to software errors. And he, you know, gives current example of self-driving cars like Toyota, where you know a couple, a couple dozen people have been killed as a result of software. So, um, I think there needs to be a discussion at some point of how the these management things. And I'm a big believer in scientific management tools. Sure. But uh, how these things in the wrong hands of project managers and people who may not be engineers can undermine the end result. Anyways, that's it. <laughs> so it's, your comment is well taken. Uh, and I certainly understand the concern. And I am well aware of that conversation that's occurring. But I don't, if I can push back a little, I don't see how software is necessarily different than hardware. Hardware folks struggle with the same thing. I want to design the safest, best, whatever. Um, and you know, management says, you don't have the time, you don't have the money, I need it now, right? So I think those struggles will continue, unfortunately. Um, I don't see any way around that. But, but your point is well taken. Uh, certainly in the wrong hands, this information could, uh, you know, could contribute to bad decision making and we don't want that. So I think it's, just, it's about communication between those groups of folks. So I have a quick question. Sure. So when you make these a priori uh, estimations on story points and how long it's going to take, do you have a sort of control loop or feedback mechanism where you update them based on actual information? Yes. But that would change your whole prediction model, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, it and it also differs for different types of domains, right? Different types of projects. Sure. So do you have that built into your your agile scrum, because I, the scrum stuff that we do, we have that built in. Yes. And we go on checking our, our parameters all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and I think I mentioned this, but you're constantly, it's rolling wave planning, right? So I'm constantly taking 
the information from my sprint retrospective and I'm using that to influence my next sprint, right? Or influence my next release and how I can do that better. Um, so in this particular example, and I apologize, we only walked through one increment, um, but if I had walk through two or three increments, you would have seen that over time. Hey, I'm identifying a trend. I need to make an adjustment. Maybe my estimates are wrong. Maybe I'm, you know, I didn't give myself enough time. Maybe that job is more complex. And you would see those numbers go up and down. So, yep. Sure. I was looking at your example here. What yes. I found kind of remarkable was the last sprint over 100 story points, like 117, where the other ones are only like, I don't know, 50, 60. And I'm, I, I just found that to be very remarkable <laughs> that somehow you wouldn't split that up and make a fifth sprint. So, so I will. Uh, or is that, or is that uh, just showing you, well, this is what happens in life and. Right, so I'll be totally honest. This is a random number generator. Oh, so okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I, I I thought maybe it was. I could not use any of life. my my work examples. Uh, so this is this is based on Excel. <laughs> but in theory, yes, you are correct. You'd probably split that up. So. Any more questions? Hello again. Um, I just wanted to comment on what you said about earned value management. I find in my practice, earned value management is known more so to say how well you're a good project manager or not, versus using earned value management to say, this is how good my plan was when I baselined it. And as we moved into the actual implementation of it, this is how my plan changed. And in order for us to make it seem like we're a very good project manager, we do have a tendency to manipulate the data versus just to say, these are the reasons for my variances because I didn't know very much when I planned it three, four years ago. And, uh, and now that we're actually in the implementation phase of it, it, like she said, there's more information that you know. Uh, and so therefore your planning forward can be improved, but your baseline shouldn't change because that's how you understand where your variances are coming from. I underestimated this, I overestimated that. And also with a CPI and the SPI with the indexes, we always say it's good if it's over one, it's bad if you're below one, or and you're right on schedule, you're right on budget if you're one. But things can come up, for example, if you're underrunning. I'm on a program now, we haven't got an invoice from this one vendor for months. So we're showing an underrun because we haven't got any actual costs from them, but they're performing the work. And so is that a true underrun? It looks good because our CPI is above one, but we know that it's going to balloon when, when it's all said and done because that invoice is finally going to come in. Any more questions? No, okay, thank you very much. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you so much. <laughs>